Austin. Hi, everybody. I remember 50 years ago in a little white dress I was ready, set, you know. I remember living out my fantasy and then suddenly it became my destiny. I did not know how my life would go. Maybe too high, maybe too low, or somewhere in between. At just 13, all I needed to know was right here over my shoulder. Look at me standing there. I've got so much to share. I'm looking over my shoulder. I've got a new voice. Now I've made my choice. Looking over my shoulder. I know So uh, that's what mentoring is all about. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you just a, a, little, a little story. I figured we would sing this first, and then I would explain to you that uh, a marvelous lady named Dawn Carroll, who I've worked with for many years, came to me one day and said, uh, when I started working with you uh, 30, 30, 20 years ago, um, <laughs> You used a word that I had never heard before. You were having a conversation with someone in, in the office 
uh, Dawn worked with my manager, sitting in the manager's office, and I was talking to someone about how I had been mentored uh, as a child because I started in the business when I was four years old. And uh, there was this lady named Dinah Washington who became my first mentor and then became my godmother. And uh, then there was this guy named Quincy Jones who became my second mentor and was my, then became my godfather. And then there was a guy named Sammy Davis Jr. who was a mentor and a guy named Ray Bolger and a woman named Rosemary Clooney. And all of those people mentored me and got me to this place. So that's the only way I know to be because I always had someone saying, psst, kid, come over here. Now here's how you do the time step. Psst, kid, come over here. When you stand on stage, stand like this, don't stand like that. All of that stuff. And so I have to pass it on. So Dawn comes to me and says, I heard you use this word, I looked it up, and we have to start a mentoring foundation. And I was like, okay, great. So she started a mentoring foundation and dragged me along for the ride. And we decided we needed a song. I'm a singer, gotta have a song to go with everything. And so Dawn wrote this marvelous song. And we had a lovely young lady from the Philippines who sang the song with me. That young lady is now going to Temple in Tokyo in an exchange student program. She's studying education. She decided by the time she was 18 that she didn't want to be a singer anymore. And I kept telling her while I was mentoring her, the minute you don't want to do this anymore, you stop because this is something that you have to do, not something you want to do. And so she decided not to do it. By the way, she's decided she wants back in. I told her there will be many tests that she must pass to get back in to the wonderful world of show business. So there we were, no singer, great song, and here comes Miss Tia at the very last minute. Tia walks in, I'm talking yesterday. And I'm only telling you this for selfish reasons, I'm gonna go Trump on you. because she would be nothing without me, nothing. <laughs> she came in yesterday, she couldn't sing, she couldn't talk, look at her now. <laughs> mentoring, mentoring. <laughs> so, so, so that you can know that Tia also speaks, can you uh, just tell them a little bit about yourself? <laughs> So, Tia, Tia, you have a wonderful thing happening this week, yes? Yes, it's my birthday on Saturday. <laughs> Saturday, birthday. And do you want to tell them how much younger you're going to be? I'll be 21. Guys, 21, legal. <laughs> it's the wrong kind of mentoring. Okay, and, and uh, what are, you're going to school? Yes, I'm at Montgomery College. And? I'm studying education. Do we love this? So she talks, she's beautiful, she sings, and uh, both of us got no sleep last night. I just got in from Milan, I'm so fabulous, and international. <laughs> and so right now I'm having dinner in my mind in, in Italy, but I am so thrilled to be here with all of you. Just remember the name Tia. I'm not going to let her use a last name. Forget it, Madonna. It's over, baby. <laughs> Tia is here. And um, enjoy the day. Please hear me when I tell you. We have a tremendous mission ahead of us. Everybody keeps talking about how much trouble our country is in. I travel all over the world. This planet is in a lot of trouble. And we have a giant responsibility to this planet to be a part of the village that raises, we gotta stop lowering our children. We have to start raising them. And as an artist, my mission is to create content that elevates and raises the mentality of the people around me. Now more than ever, because we have those little sparkling things we look into all day. And our children are looking at what is there all day. So we have to have another voice we have to say, we have to send out a different message, and it's really important, really important that we do it now more than ever. Trust me, everywhere I go in the world, <clears throat> the first question that I'm asked is, has your country gone crazy? <laughs> Who's this Trump person? 
and is he really going to be the president? This is, they're not telling you this on CNN. This is how we are perceived in the world. And we've got we've to fix it. And this room is full of people who know how to fix it. And we need to connect with all the other people who know how to fix it. Because if we don't, the bad guys are going to win. It's just that simple. Bad guys, good guys have no color, no size, no age. They're just good and bad. So we got to stop labeling and we got to start sharing because the only way we're going to make it is if we understand the interconnectedness of our lives. We're all connected. You pull one thread, this tapestry falls apart. So get out your needles, get out your thread, vote for Tia. Please welcome Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership CEO, David Shapiro. Well, we broke the ice. I'm not going to sing, and Trump has been used as a verb, which was pretty exciting. This first experience, and we had our first Trump reference. I'm sure he's somewhere very glad we're all talking about him. Um, but, uh, but I really want to, I want to thank Patty uh, and, and what an incredible way to open this year's summit. It was, uh, it was me doing a tap dance routine or Patty singing and Tia, and I thought uh, that was a better choice. I'm sure you did too. So I want to give them another round of applause. That was an amazing way to start. And uh, we are, you know, absolutely so grateful uh, to you for using your time and talents to advance uh, the mentoring movement. I hope this won't get old, but it's the first time of many uh, that we're going to say thank you to all of you. Looking out at the 1,000 of you, folks who have st stepped outside the everyday pressures of wait lists and community needs and fundraising to learn together, to elevate your impact, and to make your voices heard. And thinking about the 60 workshops from leaders in research and practice, law enforcement and education, and many more realms, it validates the movement we're building together. I marvel at the power of the platforms of media and the private sector of folks like LinkedIn, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and the MBA family who have embraced mentoring as a cause worth elevating with such clarity of purpose and priority. And then there's the stories. They started on Wednesday night with the young people from Friends First. Stories of powerful programs, resilient young people, heroic parents, and extraordinary communities that are our daily inspiration and motivation. And it all makes the honor of serving at Mentor that much greater and convening all of you a truly special opportunity. And the opportunity before us is to call our communities to greater connection, growth, and opportunity for all our young people. We have built the infrastructure, the momentum, and elevation, and that effort is a constant one. From our vantage point, it's evident in the almost 5,000 downloads of the elements of effective practice in just the four months since the latest edition was released. The 150 programs serving 8,000 young people now supported by the MentorCore platform, the tens of thousands of hours of technical assistance delivered by our affiliates through OJJDP's National Mentoring Resource Center, and the more than 10,000 inquiries from people wanting to become mentors through the Mentoring Connector this month, more than twice that of last January's total, and so directly resulting from the In Real Life campaign that all of you have embraced and elevated. Nationally, We've worked to ensure mentoring is a centerpiece of, it, of the My Brother's Keeper effort, in efforts to battle truancy with the Department of Education, and in work to bolster school and workforce supports for opportunity youth. The movement is growing and is poised because of your leadership, your investment, and your commitment to the vision described by one of our founders, a legend of human rights activism and sport. Bill Russell said that America can only fulfill its promise when there is no such thing as other people's children. In this room at the summit, 
We hold strong to this ethos of shared humanity and responsibility. But I need not remind you that it certainly doesn't feel that way for all of our young people and communities across this nation. In places like Flint and Ferguson, my hometown of Baltimore, and in far too many neighborhoods in every corner of this country. As a movement, this is where we face persistent headwinds. People who would dismiss us as doing work on the periphery or do not see the urgency of this work. This is where we are called to organize and activate for a resetting of priorities. What does it say about our priorities when there are 121 blocks in Chicago where a million dollars per block of taxpayer money is being spent to incarcerate nonviolent drug offenders while we fight for tens of thousands of dollars for education and youth development programs. How can we feel confident in our priorities when ISIS is able to prey on our young people over social media because of the vulnerability of isolation and disconnection in too many of their lives? Are we calling for the right priorities when the voices that permeate are the ones that talk a whole lot more about building walls between us rather than how we can build a, a nation of connection, mobility, and opportunity? So many stories over the last year have shown us the destructiveness of disconnection, of hopelessness, and lack of relationship. And therein lies the urgency of a call for mentoring. The fact that one challenge can derail a young person's chances for success simply because no one was there to work through it with them. Our charge is to take our momentum, the platforms, the partnerships, the results, and instill a sense of urgency in the public mind. An urgency that says it is unwise and destructive that nine million young people are growing up in isolation. And quite simply, it is unjust. In a new book, Jess Mercy, by Brian Stevenson, an incredible activist and lawyer, a woman named Mrs. Jennings explains why she has taken on the plight of a young man who is not her own. Mrs. Jennings says, Brian, some have been through more than others. But if we don't expect more from each other, hope better for one another, and recover from the hurt we experience, we are surely doomed. It is time for us to not, not only to expect, but to demand more from others in support of our young people. Call them to join our movement, a movement to connect young people to networks of support and guidance, because these are the basic needs of all young people. Stability, relationship, resources, and love. We must ensure these connections in real life are at the very core of American possibility. Thanks so much. <laughs> I'm not above begging for your applause, as you can see. <laughs> Just want to be loved. Um, if only my wife were here. Um, and, and now we turn uh, to an extraordinary example of private sector commitment. A few years back, AT&T was unique in setting not only an ambitious goal when it came to financial investment and mentoring, but hand in hand with that was the commitment of a goal of a million hours of employees mentoring through their, Inspire, their Aspire initiative and in partnership with so many nonprofits and schools in this room and throughout this country. Its ultimate aim was to boost graduation rates for young people. As you might imagine, the results have been both inspiring and impactful. I would ask that you turn your attention to the screens and then we'll be, we will be joined by one of AT&T's leaders who with a great team has helped to make this a reality. Thank you all very much. I'm going to read the essay that I wrote for the essay competition for at and I moved to the United States about two years ago. In Pakistan, I was a shy little girl who had no idea how the real world worked. I wasn't very confident in myself since I had moved to a new country where almost everything was different. I mostly tried to stay to myself, not participate in class much, and get good grades. 
The following year, AT&T volunteers started coming to our class and taught us speaking skills, interviewing skills, budgeting, and talked about career options. Meeting people like Mr. Radcliffe has changed my perspective on life, and I can only wish other students to get the amazing AT&T experience that I was fortunate enough to get. With Fatima specifically, I saw her start to be more confident. Seeing her on stage, it just seemed like all of the work we've done was worth it and she blossomed into a professional presenter. One in three students at risk of dropping out of high school grow up without a mentor in their life. AT&T launched the Aspire Mentoring Academy in the fall of 2012 to help improve graduation rates by providing students with mentoring by AT&T employees. As of January 2016, AT&T employees reached a milestone impacting more than 160,000 students with one million hours of mentoring. At first I was nervous because she was like far away, she was from Texas and like she was like a stranger, like I was shy, I didn't know what to say. My experience with We Teach Science has been great. I'm in Texas, she's in California, but that didn't stop us from having a bond and if it weren't for the video and the platform of math itself, I wouldn't have had a chance to get to know her. The moments are counting down. I've flown in from Texas and I'm ready to go and say hello to Val in person. AMA helped me bring my confidence up and it helped me bring my grade up in math because back then I had an F and now I have like an A+. I've had a four-year mentee at Kimball High School. Antoine Marshall is his name. It's been a very, very fulfilling experience to see him grow. Moreover, it's been an opportunity for me to grow as a mentor. Mentorship should be a very honest thing. It should be a very truthful thing in which we share our experiences and our faults and our shortcomings and our successes as well. At one time, you were those people sitting in those seats. You were those people walking in those shoes of those school hallways. And frankly, you probably doubted yourself. I think mentorship is giving back that hope reinforcing the age-old tales that we say about you can do anything. These students can do anything, but the reality is they need someone to show them the way. And the Aspire Mentoring Academy has been an excellent opportunity for me to do that. Please welcome AT&T's Associate Vice President of Community Engagement, Jason Liker. It's, uh, it's my table that's laughing over there if uh, perfectly fitting uh, introduction music for me. Good morning. A few years ago, we set a goal for students to benefit from one million hours of mentoring uh, by our employees before the end of 2016. And at the time, that number seemed very daunting. In fact, as someone responsible for help making that come to life, uh, there have been many sleepless nights lost. For that reason, I'm very humbled to stand in front of this audience knowing the incredible things that each and every one of you are accomplishing and share that our employees have reached this milestone. <clears throat> They've given one million hours of their time away from work and busy schedules, sometimes away from their own families to spend time with students who need it most. It has truly been impressive to watch. But what's more impressive is the 160,000 lives that student, 160,000 young lives that have been impacted by, through mentoring. Young people like Fatima in the video who gained confidence as a recent immigrant to this country, or Valeria who now aspires to attend college at UCLA. Success stories like these are inspiring and are what drives me and my team to find new ways to reach even more students through our Aspire Mentoring Academy program. But you all know as well as anybody, reaching mentoring milestones isn't easy. In fact, building an impactful and quality mentoring program is hard. It's as hard as any challenge I have faced over the course of my 20-year career. A career that includes challenging assignments in network operations, 
product marketing, regulatory call centers, and sales teams. Listen, if anybody tries to tell anybody in this room that it's not difficult, please allow me to be part of that conversation. <laughs> Even with all of the resources we have at AT&T, there's no way we could have made a difference for young people without those of you with boots on the ground every single day in our communities. There are many of you in this room that have been with, with us from the beginning. You joined our journey over the past several years to help us make our Aspire Mentoring Academy program impactful, and we thank you for your partnership. Reaching this milestone was not even remotely possible without you. It is especially meaningful to be here at the summit to celebrate this achievement as the work happening by everyone in this room is changing the trajectory of young people's lives, and that's a really big deal. For AT&T, we're excited about what, the, what lies ahead for our Aspire Mentoring Academy program. We have set our sights on reaching more students in more ways in more places around the globe, and we look forward to doing that with those of you in this room. Thank you. Please welcome the head of social impact at LinkedIn for Good, Meg Garlinghouse. conference. This is awesome. Um, so I'm Meg Garlinghouse and I actually wanted to echo my congratulations to AT&T. They have certainly set a new and amazing benchmark for other corporations to follow and I'm very, very grateful. Another round of applause. Um, so I am truly honored to be here at this um, very early hour. Any other West Coasters out there? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think my alarm has even gone off yet on my iPhone. Um, but I'm awake and I could not be more excited to be talking to you about the connection between mentorship and economic opportunity. Um, so over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to share an incredible campaign that we recently did with Mentor and hopefully inspire you to join us in making an even bigger impact this fall. So at LinkedIn, we focus on connecting talent with opportunity at massive scale. But we also know that while talent is distributed evenly across our great nation, opportunity is not. And we actually believe that mentoring can help close that mentoring gap, or rather that opportunity gap. So let me start with a story. This is actually a story that was just shared with me by one of my colleagues a couple weeks ago. This is a story about Elijah. Elijah was, I think born originally in New Zealand um, to parents who, who are from the Philippines, and he came, they immigrated to San Francisco when he was just five years old. A couple years ago, Elijah was having difficulty finding his way in life, but fortunately, he came across a terrific local nonprofit called Mission Techies. And at Mission Techies, Elijah met a LinkedIn employee named Ian. Through this mentoring relationship, Elijah was inspired to learn more, not just about what it meant to be a designer, which Ian is, learn more about how to code, but most importantly, what Elijah, was, was, what, what Elijah learned about and what it meant to work at a technology company, a company like LinkedIn. It absolutely changed what was in his line of sight of what opportunity was available to him. As many of you know in the room, I don't need to tell you, that one of the beautiful things about mentorship is it's mutually beneficial. There's no question that Elijah has benefited from this great relationship, but if Ian were standing with me right now, he would say that he actually benefited more. The other thing that I don't need to tell you is that mentorship is contagious. As you probably know, 90% of people who have been mentored go on to, to mentor themselves. And in this case, Elijah did just that. Elijah now um, not only ha has gotten a job, he graduated top of his class and currently works for the city of San Francisco and their digital platform, but now he spends his time mentoring students that are part of the Mission Techies program, which is amazing. And in the land where I hail from, where people are obsessed with scale, and things going viral, I'm here to tell you that mentorship 
can scale and go viral. And that's why LinkedIn is doubling down on mentorship. One of the greatest injustices of our time is that where you're born, what zip code you're born into, and how much money your family makes still plays a hugely influential role in the outcome of your life. And that's not true just here in the US, but around the world. But what if we challenge the whole notion of what it meant, was meant to be well connected? What if everyone could be well connected? What if every, everyone could be well connected, the people could guide them and inspire them, to the knowledge that could enlighten and transform them? What if everyone could pursue the biggest goals they could imagine, regardless of race, gender, and socioeconomic status? LinkedIn's vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And we, we mean every, we mean every. And this is where we think mentorship can help us get there. In order to make vi this vision reality, we need to make sure that we don't leave those behind that face the greatest obstacles. This is why we're fo focused on opportunity youth. We believe that opportunity youth face some of the biggest obstacles out there. Today, the youth unemployment rate in the US is twice the national rate. And the unemployment rate for young people is about four times the national rate. But there's actually, this is where LinkedIn for Good comes in, the social impact arm of LinkedIn. Our mission is to ensure that underserved communities, or in this case youth, have access to the network's information and opportunities they need to succeed. And again, we believe mentorship can help connect them to the networks, the advice, and opportunities. And so let me now finally turn to mentorship and some really, really great news. So we have millions, literally millions of people on LinkedIn who want to be mentors. Actually, how many people in the audience have a LinkedIn profile? Oh my gosh, that is fantastic. I think if I had been here five or six years ago and asked that question, it would have been crickets. And in fact, when I first started working at LinkedIn about five and a half years ago, and I called my, my dad to tell him I was working at LinkedIn, he literally thought I was working at the Lincoln car dealership. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I will tell you, he also now has a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> so, um, so there are actually f um, about, we have 400 million members on the LinkedIn ne network currently. Um, but what you may not know is within, on your profile, we added what we call the volunteer and causes section. How many people have, add, have added the volunteer and causes section? Wow, you guys are a great audience. Um, and within this section, so there's more than 20 million people who've added this section, which is pretty extraordinary. And there's a huge testament to how people, professionals, want to make social impact part of their professional identity. But within this section of 28 million people, there's the ability to check a box that says you're interested in doing skilled volunteering. It's actually the only thing you can do on your LinkedIn profile that's aspirational, that's forward-looking. And to date, more than 7 million people have checked that box. And we surveyed them and asked them, what type of volunteering do you want to do? And 75% said specifically they're interested in mentoring. So that's how we came up with this number of 5.5 million people who want to mentor, which is amazing. And what's even more amazing is that you can find them on LinkedIn. You can go and search to see where, where they work, where they went to school. So I, I did that last night for some fun facts. So as you can see, more than 10,000 people actually work at Google. More than 7,000 went to Amherst. That's a nod to David Shapiro's alma mater. Any other Amherst people out there? OK. And the more than 75,000 people live in the DC area. Although I couldn't find anyone who lives in DC, works at Google, and went to Amherst. That person apparently doesn't exist. <laughs> so that's the, that's the amazing news, um, that if you walk away remembering nothing else, please remember that we have an em enormous abundance of people who want to mentor on LinkedIn. So knowing this and watching this, this enormous trend over the last couple of years, we decided we had to do something about it. And so we called Mentor. I think we literally called him about the same time last year. And David said he couldn't talk right now. Give him a couple, a couple weeks to, to, to uh, recover from the conference. But we got on the phone and realized that we had the assets of a terrific partnership. We had all these professionals who were interested in mentoring. They had all these extraordinary opportunities that were looking for mentors. So we launched the campaign. And we launched it in a two-phased approach, sort of a, a, secret, a secret strategy I'll walk you guys through. 
So the first phase was a thank your mentor campaign. So we reached out to our millions of members around the country and asked them to reflect about the extraordinary power that mentorship has had on their lives. And they shared their stories through our blog posts, like the one you see here that David had written. But they also went on, onto their network on the Facebook, and they thanked their mentor with the hashtag, thank your mentor. More than 900 people shared stories, and more than 100,000 people thanked their mentor. So now that we've sort of primed people, gotten them to reflect about these amazing mentors that you heard from Patty and others that have had on their lives, we were ready to attack. We were ready to pull in their heartstrings and get them to commit to paying it forward, and that's what we did. So phase two, what we did was we ingested the extraordinary mentor opportunities that are part of the Mentoring Connector. How many people in the room have those opportunities on the Mentors database? Terrific. So those, those opportunities are literally being pulled into the LinkedIn network as I, as I speak. So we use our jobs platform to pull in these mentoring opportunities, and we connect them with the mentors who we know are interested in mentoring opportunities. And we specifically targeted the people who had participated in phase one. So that's how we connected um, the professionals with these terrific opportunities. And it actually worked. There was a 150% increase in mentor applications the week that we pushed it. And uh, here are two examples that I highlight. Um, one is from Spark. Any Spark folks in the audience? And the other is from iMentor. And just to show you how well it really does work, is you can see, actually, it's probably too small for you to see, but I think on the Spark case, they, they, it was posted a week ago, and they've already gotten 12 applications, and I think iMentor has already gotten 25. So this actually really does work. The, there was an extraordinary appetite among our members to find these opportunities. But I have to tell you, we've really only scratched the surface. There is so much more that we could do. The campaign, campaign worked, but it's far from reaching those 9 million people that we all together, we are all so focused on together making an impact for. And you know, I am actually not typically an optimistic person. I'm more of a realist. I come from the Midwest. I come from Topeka, Kansas, and the country, the state where you say things exactly how they are. But in this case, I could not be more bullish about this opportunity we have to finally close the mentoring cap and in doing so, close the opportunity gap. But we need your help. We are committed to doing something even bigger and more impactful this fall, but we need your ideas and we, most importantly, need your mentoring opportunities to feed onto the LinkedIn network so they can be connected with the professionals who so desperately want to mentor the students you all serve. So please join me this fall. I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like yet, but I would love your ideas. And together, I'm pretty confident that we can close the mentoring gap for good. Thank you very much. Please welcome Senior Director of External Affairs, Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, Diane Quest. depending on which way you're facing. It's amazing to be here again and see so many of you out in the crowd joining us yet again, and of course, <laughs> despite the weather that we seem to run into every year. So thank you for being here. It's my pleasure this morning to engage in a conversation with our next special guest, coach and mentor John Lucas. John Lucas is a retired professional basketball player and coach, and because that isn't impressive enough, he also played on the US national tennis team in 1974 and played in the World Championship where they won the bronze medal. In 1990, he founded John Lucas Enterprises, which is a network of drug treatment programs that is actually aimed especially at athletes. John Lucas arguably could have been one of the best, if not the best, point guard in the history of the NBA. But his playing career was hampered by drug and alcohol dependency. He finally hit rock bottom at the same time that he had signed a contract to play with the Milwaukee Bucks. And that's actually when he began his long and painful recovery process to restore both his reputation and his abilities. Since those days, Lucas has dedicated himself to helping others with addiction to regain control of their lives by forming John Lucas Enterprises heading up the Miami Tropics basketball team, and actually coaching three NBA teams, 
and ultimately creating John Lucas Basketball Resources, he has created an extensive network of both support and programming that helps athletes to progress to achieve sobriety and reach their full potential. Through his own recovery, John Lucas has achieved 30 years of sobriety this March. <laughs> Through that personal achievement, he has given himself and others who experience the same disappointments and addictions really the chance of a lifetime. The opportunity to prove that they are up for the challenge to overcome their addictions and really, really reach for their dreams. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome to the stage coach and mentor, Mr. John Lucas. so much for joining us. We're, we're so fortunate to have you here with us. We appreciate your company amongst a thousand of our closest friends. <laughs> well, I'm very glad to be here, but I, you, you said in your opening speech, one of the best. <laughs> I, was, I was the best. Someone wrote this. <laughs> Someone wrote this and handed yeah. it to me as I walked on the stage. You, the best. You know, before you start, I am. Um, I want to thank all of you all for helping people like me. I was a lost soul 30 years ago, and through the NBA Players Association and the NBA, uh, I was able to return to basketball. I found myself through Alcoholics Anonymous and mentors all over the world whose last names I don't even know. And I didn't have a suit. And my original mentor, my father, said, you find one before the morning. Because you owe these people a gratitude or thanks for giving you back the chance to be the father you wanted to be, the friend you wanted to be, and the husband I always dreamed of being. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. So as you know, these, the folks out in the crowd here work with mentors through formal mentoring programs day in and day out. They really are the boots on the ground, the grassroots of this movement. We had you here yesterday for a small focus group um, to start talking about and looking at informal mentoring and how our field can really take what we've learned as best practices and apply that to some of the people who work day in and day out with young people not necessarily through formal mentoring, but as informal mentors, natural mentors, coaches, teachers, counselors, Uncle Joe down the street. And so we did a small focus group, and I just wanted to ask you, you know, in your experience, we have a huge mentoring gap. There are nine million young people growing up without a mentor right now. It's gonna take all of us to close that, but it's gonna take a whole lot of other people, including formal mentors, people who are in this role and, and work with youth. What are your thoughts on, on how we can use them and leverage them and get them into this movement? Well, first of all, I think everybody's a mentor. Whoever you are, our young kids come in touch with uh, mentors of some form, either good or bad. There are good coaches, bad coaches, and then there are bad mentors. And one of the things that I like to identify mentorship with is like being a coach. A coach first is a mentor. He has to mentor and guide his people that he works with. And then secondly, a coach and a mentor is a counselor. We have to be able to listen. We have to be able to correct and move forward. And the third thing is you have to be able to educate or teach them whatever you're trying to help them become. And this is where it gets tricky as the fourth one. It's positive confrontation. How do I confront somebody to make them want to get better without killing or amputating their spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so important about mentorship is that normally people who mentor people are people who once lost their spirit, who regained themselves to now try to help somebody else because they know the gift that they could have mm -hmm. by being somebody. Mm -hmm. See, mentorship is selfish. 
I do it because I get more out of giving than I get from getting back. It's um, full of self-examination. Mentorship always has me self-examining my motives and why I want to do something. Because um, if you don't know why you're in it, you can't pass on something you don't have. Mm -hmm. And I think that came up a lot yesterday, this idea of authenticity and honesty in that relationship. Yeah, I, I think you have to become very vulnerable. Last night I had to leave because there's a young kid of the University of Maryland that I'm working with for football who's lost his way, and he wants to blame life for his plight. He wants to blame being black for his plight. He wants to be blamed everything else for his plight in life, and his way of doing it is hiding through honesty. Mm -hmm. And I told him, let's self-examinate yourself to see if any of that is real. And it isn't. The one thing that mentorship has is that I must be truthful to them. I can't be a mentor if I'm smoking with the kids I'm trying to mentor. I can't be a mentor if I'm not where I'm supposed to be, where I am. Because one thing kids know, they know the truth. Mm -hmm. And I've never worked with a kid that didn't know the truth, whether he acted on the truth or not. He knew the truth. So that's one of the other things with the authenticity. You know, one other thing in mentorship that I had was that as a father, I was out trying to save the world. And my wife, my, 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 my son stole a condom from Walmart to be in a game. And she called me up, you're out here going around the world trying to save everybody else's kids and you're not doing anything with your own. And he had your last name. And that hit me like a ton of bricks is that I can't give something that I don't even address, that's what's right next to me. If I can't address my own children, how do I think I'm gonna be able to address others? It's amazing. So another thing that came up yesterday, and for this audience, is the idea of you know, someone with your background may not pass a background check, may not be eligible to work through a program but I wanna talk a little bit about the experiences that you've had and others who have had similar challenges through life and the importance of them sharing those when they're ready through mentoring with young people. Well, you know, now in basketball, on grassroots level, they have mentorship uh, background checks. And a lot of kids, a lot of people who wanna work in basketball have felonies, have other things, but that's our environment. So one of the things that I, I always do is I never ask anybody for their resume. I ask them for their behavior. And so what I'll do is I'll let them come to the gym and I can teach you basketball. I can't teach you how to mentor. It's a gift. It's an art. It's a love and a re requirement of our fellow man to mentor the next one. Because if we don't, we won't have a society. Mm -hmm. And what is it that you personally feel that you get back from these relationships that you have when you're mentoring a young person? There's nothing greater for all of you all who are mentoring. Greatness, as Patty Austin, one of my favorites, she's up here, right, singing. <laughs> There's nothing greater than to hear someone repeat something you've said in another environment and you're not even there. It is, I tell people all the time, greatness is so overrated, but we all want a little bit of greatness. <laughs> but it's nothing like hearing somebody say something you've said and then you can't take the credit, because you know, I always want, I, I told him that. <laughs> and you have to be quiet, because all you did was what you were supposed to do. It's a, it's a little bit of a living legacy when you see that and hear that and, and have it come back that, that that 
that wisdom has been passed on and you know it's gonna keep being passed on. Well, you know, it's funny about mentorship. I wasn't the guy that would want to have been a mentor. I was a valedictorian of my high school class. I um, have a master's in secondary education and I ended up on drugs. And so when kids tell me about their plight and problem, I say all the time, just cause somebody put you on the piss pot backwards didn't mean you had to stay that way. <laughs> that means you could have got up and turned around at any moment. So let's get up and turn around now. Somehow I can guarantee you that that one's going to be repeated <laughs> <laughs> a number of times by all of us. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. I want to just offer you one last, any final words, any words of wisdom for this, this audience that that works in this area every day? Well, you know, the one thing is that we don't win them all, right? We actually lose more than we actually win. But the opportunity to serve and to be of service is such a blessing. That's the most spiritual thing you can do, is to be there from someone from an act of love, kindness, and warmth. So for you all to come and educate and learn at all levels of mentorship. Just remember the responsibility. You know, today when I came, I thought about who I represented. I represented my daughter, my family, the NBA Players Association, the NBA, and now I represent you. So I put on a suit today as much as I wanted to wear a warm-up because I wanted to thank you <laughs> for giving me my life back. And it is more important that although I lost it all and regained it all, the greatest day of my life was the day I was broken, March 14, 1986. Because that day I learned one thing. I was no longer going to be an irritant in life. I was going to be a contributor to life. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for representing us. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Please welcome Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership Board Chair, Vim Quaker. Well, <clears throat> well that was some powerful experiences we just had. What a beautiful opening for the, for the, com for the couple of next days. So I welcome everybody. This is our sixth summit. Unless anyone begins to think that these summits may have begun to feel routine, it is clear from this extraordinary opening plenary session that, um, that this could never feel routine. It is clear as well that the mentoring movement is growing, innovating, and thriving. I would like to thank this morning's extraordinary presenters, although this may have been most obvious opening session ever. Everyone expressed a common mission and vision, especially for the young people at our best when we are connected and supported. We deeply appreciate and admire all that each of you does to create powerfully connected, supported, and thriving mentoring communities. Last night at the Library of Congress, we spotlighted this year's National Excellence Mentoring Honorees and leaders in the movement who are representative of all of you and were nominated by mentors, exemplary partners. I'd like to call your attention to the program where they are listed and give special mention to the Reverend Wilson Good, who we are so fortunate to have as a great servant leader in the mentoring movement. This morning we begin two days of connecting and learning that we hope can only improve and strengthen our work. I'm both proud of and grateful to the team, both in Mentor and from among our partners that has channeled the creativity and deep commitment to planning a summit that is substantive and relevant to our work. 
We hope that you will make connections and share vital information and that you will drive continuous improvement and the enhancement of our mission in communi communities. And we know we look around for ourselves for the last six months and nine months how difficult that is. We have made tremendous progress in the 25 years that I've been involved with Mentor, um, the last eight years as chair, uh, we have seen some tremendous advancements. We have seen a growth of a summit meeting that went from 200 people to more than 1,000 and a waiting list. And that is inc incredibly encouraging. The experience that we saw this morning is just unbelievably powerful stuff. And, uh, but we have made tremendous enhancement. We will continue to do so because uh, you will hear, not the, excuse me, everybody knows, there's a lot of work to, uh, work to be done. And especially in today's climate, in today's climate where communication such as LinkedIn and all the work that we do and the speed with which news travels around the world, you should think we should be coming closer together. But there are other forces at work that undermine that. Instead of opening up more, we do incidentally because of organizations like we have, we also see that the building of walls, physical walls, or mental walls or psychological walls is happening at the same time. We have somebody running for president whose name I forgot who wants to build walls around this country. We have migration in Europe where, people, where, where currently countries try to close their borders. That is the exact opposite of what we will be discussing here for the next two, three days. And uh, that we should keep in the back of our mind. We should never, ever give up because this is absolutely essential. I agree with whatever has been said and the powerful examples that we have seen so far are incredibly encouraging to all of us. And yes, the mentor and the mentee gain both of us. I mean, that is the, that is the most encouraging part. But we are also working in an environment that it would appear that as we are having faster speed of communications, that the walls seem to be uh, elevated as well. So. Keep that in mind, that is what we have to overcome, and we can only do it one on one, 10 on 10, um, a million hours, which is incredibly impressive. If I compare that with just 25 years ago, that is just giving me the chills. So that is our main task ahead of us. We should never, ever give up, and we should always do it in a safe and encouraging way. So thank you very much for being here, and have a great two days. Thank you.